Welcome, Welcome to Freddy's Huge Ask Podcast. Huge lives and the stories behind them. Three, two, one. And now here's your host, Freddy Cruz. Talking about overcoming doubt and living a life with no regrets. It's the author of The Science of Empowerment, Laura Ballet. Hello. Hello, Freddy. Hi, thank you for joining the podcast. So I want to begin with you and your brother. Yeah. Because this is an interesting dynamic. I love my sister. I love my brother. I couldn't imagine spending all day with them as a career, but you do. You and your brother do this. Yeah, we, we get this um, reaction everywhere we go because we spend time at our summer home where we spend all our holidays together. We work together. We've created together. But um, it's really a testament to my parents and how they raised us to really have love at the foundation of everything that we do, understanding that challenges are going to come into play. So we don't always, you know, get along and agree, but we have this amazing synergy and we want to empower and help create a better world. So that is what drives us to get along. So we are an authentic example of what the science of empowerment actually is and how it works in our own life. What was the first instance of either you or him empowering the other and then realizing that's that there's maybe that there's something there? Yeah. Well, just to keep it um, transparent, it really was my desire to write I've been wanting to write since I was a child and I've been writing and I had hundreds of journals. I actually had an opportunity to write for Hallmark greeting cards, um, but I did not follow through with that. And my brother always said, there's a brilliance in you and it needs to come out. And once he created this formula, I was so inspired by how it really healed and elevated our clientele that I sat down and five years later, the science of empowerment was written. Yeah. <laughs> really his encouragement to, to tap into my, my brilliance. And that is not stating from an egoic perspective. It's what you want everyone to do. You want everyone to tap into that amazing potential and you want the support from the people that matter to you. So it's, it's a real authentic exchange of wanting the very best for one another. Absolutely. I want to go into the concept of, of positive thinking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a stat that I, I go back to, and it was something that I learned just this past summer uh, while listening to the Art of Impossible audiobook, And that is, that 80% of our thoughts are negative and of that 80%, 95% are repetitive. So our walls as, as people are already, our backs are against the wall already uh, by default because, you know, this is just who we are as, as humans and, and those negative thoughts um, at one point during the beginning of evolution served us because that's how we, Oh wait, better, better avoid that saber tooth tiger. Right. <laughs> but um, in, in modern society, these, this is a, this is an issue. Yeah. And, and I, again, I write about this in the book and, and I express it as we become these walking algorithms of someone else's input and it's our parents, it's our siblings, our school, our, our, you know, churches, Um, synagogues, it's politics, it's, you know, the school teachers, it's all of what we're, it's the human condition. And we are wired to join the masses. And we do that by the way we think we're thinking about something. And one of the driving forces with the science of empowerment was to awaken this realization that we can think about thought very differently than we've been told. And we can think about thought so that we become empowered to dissolve those negative beliefs, those outdated patterns. We actually can become an outlier and create something new, something modern, something much more advancing than what we've been accustomed to. So the positive thinking is really about redesigning the architecture of thought, becoming an an, like an engineer of thought 
your own thought and the way that you can recalibrate it so that it actually creates positive experiences rather than, as you said, a repeat. And this is all we do, right? Different face, different place, same issue. And I really want to awaken people that it's not supposed to be that way. Absolutely. And the the passage, and I mentioned this before we started uh, started the interview, is that I've got specific questions about specific passages. And, and this kind of goes back to the way we were taught growing up and uh, really on a, on a broader level. And that's that if I consistently concentrate on other people and focus on what I think is wrong about their choices and their behaviors, I can find fault easily. Therefore, I have no time for my own self evaluation. So and I'm like, true. yes, sister. Yes. Oh, yes, queen. Yes, queen. <laughs> it's so true. And we all were laughing if we don't start crying because we all know what that feels like, whether it's our spouse, our kids, our boss. We just, it's everyone else but us. And this is the beauty of the, the exploration into becoming an empowered individual. When we take accountability for that part of the journey, we then can begin to evolve because it is so darn easy to find fault everywhere else. Right. And it goes back to the, to the common phrase that you, you can't control the outcome, but you can control how you react to whatever outcome. And it's a, it's a, it's a tough pill to swallow because you know what, when things don't go our way, it sucks. It does. Some of the time it does. It, 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 it does because it would just be easier if everybody bent, if everybody bent to my will and did what I wanted or didn't do what I didn't want them to do. You know what I mean? It's just so much easier, but there's a lot of growth. If you're able to, to accept that things are not going to go your way. And what if they're not meant to go your way because they're meant to test your resolve and they're meant to uh, make you a stronger individual? So it's up to you and not you, but well, us, it's up to us to to figure that out. And that's part of that's part of the human condition. And you know what? To be honest, I think if everything went my way, life would probably be kind of boring. Like when I play Atari 2600 and level one Pac-Man, it's like. How many times do you have to beat level one Pac-Man before it starts to get really boring? That's exactly, I can't believe you're using the analogy of one of those games. I just, I just went through a process with one of my clients about this. That is exactly it. We need contrast. We need the light and the dark, the negative and positive so that we, we can see where we are, where we desire to go, and that uncomfortable middle ground of where growth and elevation happens. Uh, so we do, we, we, we need it. The, the, one of the keys is, again, to becoming an empowered individual is to have the skill or the mastery, the discipline to see it coming and be able to get ahead of it if not full on ahead of it enough so that the patterns begin to soften and we really create a new way of being and a new way of experiencing everyday life. So we're at a continuous disadvantage due to our unwillingness to alter the outcome. And that's another one of those passages where I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about how specifically, like one or two things, how specifically we can divorce ourselves from the outcome so that when something, when something doesn't go right, we can just, it's what the Navy SEALs say, embrace the stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a big proponent of avoiding the embracing the suck because I've done it enough uh -huh. of my life, which is why I wrote okay. the book. Because after most of us, and even I have two, you know, young adult daughters, they've already had plenty of that experience already. So I think um, one of the really unique things for me, and I wrote about this in the book, is really getting ahead of the consequence. What would it be like to master the process of experiences without having to suffer the suck, right? What would that be like yeah. to not have to really 
consistently throughout our lives be going through this self-induced drama, right? This magnified chaos, finding ourselves in the same argument with the same person or same argument, different person. Um, what would that be? What would it be like? So for me, um, one of the ways uh, I find that the science of empowerment, the book itself is very unique, is it weaves in the principles of the J3 equals E formula. And that is, as you stated, unwillingness. How can we recalibrate to a willingness so that we stop existing in that field, in that arena, in the game of suck feelings? And how do we really just experience happiness? And I think there's a time and a place for us to have this contrast. And then there's a time and place for us to really be empowered, happy, creative human beings. And I don't think we need to stay in the negative end of the scale as long as we've convinced ourselves that we need to. What is the easiest way to ensure we live a life full of regrets? And what is the best way we can avoid that easiest way? Yeah. Well, regrets, again, that, that's a powerful word. It's um, for me, we were raised in a home where regrets really equaled contrast. And even if we came home and we took the car out when we weren't supposed to or crashed into a stone wall <laughs> or did something, my parents always sat us down and always asked, did you learn anything from that experience? And they really empowered us to think about what we did. How did our actions affect our growth process and how did they affect someone else? So early on, we really learned to be accountable. So I think for other people, maybe that didn't have, weren't exposed to that, you know, a life of regret, all I would say is look at it and find, find the PowerPoint of the lesson in the regret. So I got married too young, blew all my money, should have, could have, would have. All right, let's look at it for a moment. Let's focus on it for a moment. And what can we extract out of that regret so that it does not happen again? You have learned something of value from that regret. So we'll turn the regret into a recalibration skill. I want to go to one more short, very short passage, which I love. I feel like, and now know, now knowing that you could have been a Hallmark card writer, <laughs> <laughs> I really love this passage. It's a very short one. Fear has no place within a civilized mind. And I'm like, yeah. are you kidding? There were so many mic drop moments in this book. That was another one. I would say probably, I mean, like you, there's so much wisdom and insight that I drew off of the universal connection that I feel blessed. I, I really feel it came through, but that came to me one night when I was writing, and that for me says it all. A civilized mind does not connect to fear. It's aware of areas, right, that need more attention to others, but fear, that word, like we don't even use it ever, not in our home, not in our neuromuscular training facility. I've actually, I have a, a new acronym for it forever empowered and resourceful. Always. I like it. Always. Always remind yourself how empowered. And for me, when you walk around the world and you see things that you know are not in correct alignment with a civilized society, whether it's our politics, whether it's the, the homeless cities that are all over and the drugs and the violence and I feel like we're in a very uncivilized state of mind right now. We're in the 21st century. We're an amazing country. We have such innovative spirits moving around the world. What has happened that we're still behaving in this manner of such negative output, the way we speak to each other? And that goes for even our leadership. Um, what is happening? So I don't, I think if, we understood what civilized really meant. And the if you look at that word and, and how it's supposed to elevate from one place to another, so much of what we do is based on fear. 
And fear does not belong in a civilized mind or a society. We, a lot of the negativity that we're experiencing is out of fear, personal fear and collective fear. This is why we act out the way we do. We're afraid. We're afraid of, and then fill in the, right, the copious amount of reasoning that we're, we're all in fear of things, being alone, being neglected, being an outcast, um, fear of failure, fear of success, not feeling like we fit in, um, all of that. Um, I really would like for us to collectively dissolve that word and the energy attached to the word. <laughs> it, it goes back to something that I once heard Robert Greene talk about is that we're the only, we're the only species on earth conscious of our own mortality. So when you talk about fear, it's a fear of insert what, insert everything, yeah. a fear of whatever. And it's, well, I wonder how much of what you're talking about with regards to fear goes back to, well, yeah, I'm going to die. And what if I die because of X, Y, Z, or I die in spite of X, Y, Z, or I die with X, Y, Z unfinished business, whether mm -hmm. it's actual business or unfinished business in personal life or whatnot. There's so many leaders and, and, and phenomenal like sages and masters in the world that have collectively voiced in one way or another this following story. What happens at the end of our life and we're laying there in our bed and all the ghosts of what could have been and should have been are visiting us and they're reminding us of what we did not do because we were afraid. And I think that's you know what I'm trying to express. Go forth, even in the face of fear. Create a civilized mind, even though you may feel unprepared. Think and be as if you were this advanced human thinking soul and just play with it like a game, right? If right now this was a game and we knew there were not any real life consequences, we would be creating the pyramids again. We would be flying to other galaxies. We would be building other worlds and constructing the most amazing visual manifestation of what we think about. Do it. What is stopping us? It's such a short span that we're here. Maybe a hundred years and future generations will start living longer. And maybe there'll be a time when you know, we're experiencing 500 year lifetimes, but we aren't right now. So why sit in this seat of, oh my God, what if, how could you let it go? Just go for it. Dream big, goal big, embrace the genius and the brilliance that is within and really understand. And I don't mean this in a, a fluff way. We really are made up of elements that create galaxies. We really have coded in our DNA genius, untapped potential. And if anyone is telling you otherwise, then please hear my voice and let me be the reminder. Do not listen to them. There is something in every one of us that is of value and, uh, and is of importance to add into this global family. Don't wait. And again, move past it. Just blow through that door, regardless of the word fear and the feeling of fear. I love what you said there because I think that, okay, well, let me back up. That was not fluff. <laughs> and I feel like I read something similar to what you said in the book. And it got me thinking because I'm like, yeah, you know what? Dang it. We are the universe. Yeah. Everything we do is the universe. Like if, if I would have left, if I would have left home with my daughter to take her to school 15 minutes earlier or 15 minutes later, you're literally affecting countless lives um, by you deciding to not, maybe not go get a cup of coffee in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. You are literally affecting countless mm -hmm. lives and you don't know what the, what the fallout or what the result of that encounter would have been. And these are trivial examples. Right. But they're not trivial to me because, you know, and it goes back, it goes back to uh, also uh, something that I had seen um, Gary Vaynerchuk talk about where he's like, you know, when I die, I want to know all about, well, I, I think he says, I'm like, I want to know who, who's it, how many people were at my funeral. And then I want to know, like, how many times I came close to dying because I went back, 
I went back to go get my keys. I forgot my keys in the house and I went back and how many times I almost could have yeah. died because, you know, because of that. And so that's where I'm getting at is that everything we do has some sort of consequence, good, bad, or neutral. Right. Many people don't realize, again, that's the first principle in the Jekyll principles, the J three equals E formula. It's awareness. We matter. Even if you don't think you do, every move we make, every thought has um, an energy, a frequency, a vibration, right? Science speaking, as well as spiritual and consciousness and religion. And it's all there. These stories and this connection, they're all in place to remind us of who we are and why we are here together. However, because we have become such a self-centered thinking world we really has we've lost that that vision of what i say really does affect the whole what i do affects the collective and you are absolutely right there are no coincidences forgetting a set of keys leaving something on the counter pulling out and and stopping because you hear a noise all these little um, moments in life are tapping on us because there is already a ripple effect going out. And one of the things I try to do with my clients and certainly with the book is express that, that when you're driving in your car and you left the house and there's anger in you because you got into a fight or you were disheveled or you were pressured, kids out, dog out, taking care of the baby, daycare, all of what we have experienced in one way or another. And we bring that energy into the road. We bring that energy into our place of work, in the post office, in the grocery store. We actually vibrate what we're feeling, even if we're totally unaware of it, which is why some of us can look at someone and pick up that they're sad, they're hurt, there's something wrong. And when we start to realize that our energy actually has causation, on the collective wellness of the planet, we start to take your thought process, your behavior in the world a bit differently. But it's a discipline and it's, a, it's an exploration into mastering that awareness. But it's why we're here. We are not here to live in a state of stagnation or sameness. We are absolutely here to evolve, to thrive, to advance. Uh, and and it's we're starting to see it everywhere in the news and in programs and in movies, but we really are. And if we can tap into that, it will have a more positive effect on the whole. The name of the book is The Science of Empowerment. You've got to look her up on YouTube and on LinkedIn. It is by Laura Ballet, and I'm loving everything about this conversation. Thank you so much for coming by the podcast. Thank you. It was an absolute honor. Thank you so much, Freddie. Thank you for listening to Freddie's Huge Ask Podcast. 